Yeah. Hi, I'm Mike Berry. Oh, hey, Talk a million times. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, there you go. Okay. You can be at the head of the table again. Yeah. Very, very honored to have you all as um, awardees for the American Honors Recovery. I always want to say luncheon because that's kind of like where it all started. Um, if you don't know, the American Honors Recovery Luncheon started back in 2004 with the Johnson Institute. Um, I was uh, honored to be part of that as an employee of the Johnson Institute. And what we did was we put it together to honor people that have contributed to um, folks in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction. And as part of that, um, as the Johnson Institute kind of merged into the Hazleton Foundation, uh, we uh, combined with Faces and Voices of Recovery to host this each year. So um, as a kind of like an impromptu get together, get to know one another um, event, <laughs> we decided to, to host this lunch and so you all could kind of uh, get to know one another and we could get to know you and um,
Ministry was founded 10 years ago, if you can believe it, at a national summit in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we have the honor and privilege to be uh, governed by a board of directors, many of whom are here right now. And I'd ask people to raise their hand. Uh, thank you so much. We also have a wonderful and dedicated staff um, whose names have been flashing across the screen. Uh, we really thank them so much, and we thank you. Thank also our volunteers who have uh, helped to put together this incredible annual America Honors Recovery event. I'd also like uh, to make a special thanks to our other funders, uh, the Open Society Foundation, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. Uh, we're honored to have Administrator Hyde and CSAT Director Wesley Clark with us. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, as Congressman Patrick Kennedy said last year at our America Honors Recovery event, recovery from addiction is a civil rights issue. All Americans have a right to recover through our health system and in the communities that they live in. So we join you in promoting, to the, promoting the right to recover through advocacy, education, and demonstrating the power and the proof of long-term recovery from addiction to alcohol and other drugs. So it gives me a great, uh, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our MC and the Chair of Faces and Voices of Recovery's Board of Directors, Steve Gumbley. Thanks. Good evening. Hi. Welcome. And I'd like to uh, have us start with a round of applause for the person without whom this would not happen, Pat Taylor. Woo! So, welcome to America Honest Recovery. I am a face and a voice of recovery, long-term recovery. In fact, a month from today will mark a quarter century of recovery for me. I keep saying to folks that the number sounds great, but the quality is even better. <laughs> this recovery has taken me on a vast and unanticipated journey from the last night of intoxication, sitting alone, calling friends, threatening suicide. Because I was overwhelmed by hopelessness, helplessness, uselessness, and meaninglessness. The thoughts of suicide were prompted by the absence of purpose in my life. I believed that it did not matter if I woke up to another day of my life. Today, I am a man of meaning and purpose. I mean something to my family and friends, to my community, but most of all, I mean something to myself today. Today, my life is not only worth living, it's worth celebrating. When I was active in my addiction, the bad news was no matter where I went, there I was. The good news in recovery is no matter where I go, there I am. And there's a world of difference. We are here tonight to honor recovery. But more than that, we are here to honor action in behalf of recovery. The mission of Faces and Voices of Recovery is to organize and mobilize. To me, those are the two most important words in our mission. Our goal is to actualize the recovery community. Merlin Karst, a former board chair, reminded us recently that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. For too many, the claim that recovery is a reality is an extraordinary claim. Yet there are many millions in recovery. We are the extraordinary evidence, he tells us. It is essential that we continue to present the evidence. It does no good if the evidence is locked up in an evidence room or remains silent behind the fear of stigma or because of misunderstood traditions. We cannot hold policymakers and legislators accountable 
if we have not spoken up and spoken out about our recovery needs, if we have not loudly stated nothing about us without us, otherwise all they have is guesswork, good intentions, and prejudice. Many of us here tonight are here because we act in behalf of recovery. There is perhaps uh, no one who has done more in the public arena of Washington than a retiring board member and our former board chair, and I'd like to recognize Carol McDade. For all of her. Tonight we honor the remarkable talents and actions of three individuals and one organization that exemplify the power and proof of recovery and our community by putting forward their faces and voices of recovery. So congratulations to the 2011 honorees. Because of them and thousands of others like them across the country, some of the 20 million Americans in recovery we are growing stronger in numbers and influence every year, strengthening our message of hope and the reality that millions of us can and do recover from addiction. One of tonight's special announcements is that Faces and Voices is launching the Association of Recovery Community Organizations this month to increase our collective voice here in Washington and across the country. And if you'd like more information about that, Pat and the staff will be very happy to talk with you about the Association of Recovery Community Organizations. There is a change in the program. Congressman Sullivan cannot be with us tonight because of late votes on the House. So I'm happy to introduce to you our speaker for the evening, Mayor Roshan. He's a person in recovery. He is co-founder and editor-in-chief of TheFix.com, a groundbreaking new website created by people in recovery, about addiction and recovery, that launched in March. In just three months, The Fix has attracted millions of visits with a daily mix of news, investigative journalism, celebrity interviews, personal essays, and cutting-edge health and medical information. The site has received admiring reviews from the New York Observer, New York Magazine, Salon, NPR, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Roshan. Good day. Um, so you can see why it's kind of cool to be here. <laughs> we all got along really well by the end. Um, my mother, uh, who has suffered, a, you know, like a lot of addicts, suffered a lot of uh, trauma that I was too, and has followed me through, was very, very excited to hear that I was going to follow a Republican congressman. So I'm going to have to tell her that there must be some Republican congressman in here, right? Uh, she's a big uh, Rush Limbaugh fan, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, I should start by admitting that I am by no means a scientist or a specialist or an expert in this field. I do not qualify as any kind of role model. In fact, like most people or many people in early sobriety, my path has sometimes been a rocky one. After I left rehab, even after I left rehab, I spent time drinking around the clock. I'm going back to uh, detox, and it's, it's, it's not been an easy thing for someone who has been used to most of my life thinking myself as a pretty strong person. I uh, grew up in Iran, went through a revolution, survived bombings, and so you'd think I could survive, you know, get through this, uh, this illness. It's a little surprising that at a time when you can use Yelp to peruse 200 reviews of the local deli down the street, 
accurate and independent information about rehabs and addiction treatment is almost impossible to find. In a country where 4 million people enter rehab every year, there's not a single independent website that provides desperate users with the information, the full information they need to make an educated choice about what may be the most important decision of their life. I know when I was looking for rehab, uh, you know, you go on Google, put in rehab. Uh, ironically, the first thing you get if you do that is the fabulous club in uh, Las Vegas called Rehab. But uh, <laughs> beyond that, you get millions of uh, uh, basically advertisements for various rehabs. And the fact that in what is a $20 billion business that we don't have a way or haven't found a way to get consumers who desperately need help information that is so crucial is a big failure on our part and one that uh, the fix is, is was founded in part to solve. Uh, it's also been kind of perplexing to me that, you know, 40 odd years after the publication of the big book and the start of AA, we still have no ideas about AA's success rate. Uh, there are no random samplings or exit studies, so what we end up with is like a range of different data from different places, or you know, an inside in edition interview with Charlie Sheen, which uh, is then picked up as news all over the country. Uh, there are rehabs that have no compunctions about charging their patients $100,000 a month and yet can't give you an estimate of how many of their graduates are sober after two months. So, uh, this did not sit well with me as a journalist, um, suffice it to say. Uh, so shortly after I emerged from a sober living house in Venice that I was sharing with a bunch of Hasidic meth-addled teens, uh, yeah, I went from the, uh, the Aryan nation to the Hasidim, but, you know, <laughs> nothing if not personal. Uh, I returned to New York with the idea of going back to my old life and continuing my career in the journalism world. But there's a cliche in recovery that a head full of AA doesn't mix well with a stomach full of booze. And though I wasn't planning to go back to drinking, I knew I was returning essentially to the scene of the crime. Uh, and there were, as I was looking for jobs and being offered jobs, there were things that I just couldn't get out of my mind. You know, there's, uh, at Cry Help, there was a toothless, familyless meth addict who had this insane <coughs> proficiency with the piano. It was like one of, the, like, a brilliant player of Bach and had basically no family and no prospects. Uh, there was a Mormon doctor who lost his license and lost his family and uh, was basically alone after, you know, 60 years of his life. And uh, there was a good friend of mine who was a designer who died uh, after rehab at the age of 21. And so, you know, experiencing all of these people and, and anyone who's been to rehab knows how intimately you merge with your, your fellow people we have. It seemed that maybe the best way that I could put my talents to use and uh, my connections to use was to focus on this illness. Um, it's difficult to kind of even... It was uh, with these points that I began working with my excellent partners. Joe Strank and Allison Sloan on the fix. In the months since we've launched, we've received an onslaught of attention, not all of it positive. I never set out to do this in order to make friends. I do think there's a disease that deserves serious attention and a different kind of attention than it's been getting. Um, finally, 
I guess one of the, the things that, that has always surprised me in relation to AIDS, and because I remember growing up when AIDS was, because you even suspected you had it, you were going to be dead in a month. And uh, talking to doctors today, if you are diagnosed with HIV, your life extends in expectancy is probably a lot longer and, and your life is a lot better than if you are addicted to alcohol. That says a lot. That says a lot that in, in years, in do, do 60, 70 years that we've been doing this, we haven't been able to come up with something to help combat this, whereas in six years they went from zero knowledge of virology to kind of, you know, making life possible to hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, it's a lot more to go, but I know there's a lot of other people to uh, to speak. I I, I did want to say that I, I think we need to hold journalists accountable. As much as I believe in journalism, I also think they're kind of scum. Um, <laughs> in many ways, we have failed utterly in our coverage of this fatal disease. It's a travesty that Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Sheen's breakdowns are covered with a fervor that is completely absent in discussions about what's being done about the disease of the alcoholism. It falls to our community to support sites and organizations like this one that provide the latest news, resources, investigation features that are accurate and I'm afraid to challenge common thinking. The recovering moment is at a moment of desperation, but also a moment of real transformation and hope. Um, people are demanding information, accountability, and evidence that things were values that we started to fix, to promote, and to create. Um, I. Uh, I hope that we, you know, that that was why we did it, and I hope that we uh, are able to uh, fulfill that function. I have no doubt that we'll hear from you if we don't. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much for having me here, and uh, I am humbled by the honor to appear before you. And now for the presentation of the 2011 Vernon Johnson Awards. The Vernon Johnson Award honors the legacy of the Johnson Institute founder, Dr. Vernon E. Johnson, who devoted his life to spreading the message of recovery. Dr. Johnson believed together we could conquer addiction in our lifetime. His assertion that early intervention could save lives led to the creation of the Employee Assistance Program the salvation of thousands of lives and jobs. He also co-founded the Johnson Institute, giving rise to the recovery advocacy movement that we are part of today. It was his genius to bring our message of recovery to the public that rests in the heart and soul of each of this year's Vernon Johnson awardees. So to begin the presentations of, to these extraordinary people, I'd like to ask SAMHSA Administrator Pamela Hyde to come up to the stage to introduce the first recipient. I'd also like to say while you're coming up here, Faces and Voices in particular wants to say thank you. Uh, Administrator Hyde has agreed to join the board of Faces and Voices at our retreat in a couple of days and uh, spend some time with us, which is a really valuable thing. Thanks so much, Steve and Pat and all of you for, at uh, Faces and Voices Recovery. I'm really pleased to be here. I think all of you know that SAMHSA has put a great deal of um, focus on the issue of recovery, and we are talking about that now as a process of change, whereby individuals work to improve their own health and wellness and to live a meaningful life in the community of their choice while striving to achieve their full potential. We know that recovery requires attention to health, dealing with the disease of addiction, we know that it requires home, a safe and affordable and stable place to live that supports people in their recovery. We know that it requires community, a group of caring friends and family, 
who cares and understands what the person is going through and welcomes the individual back into the life of the community. And we also know it requires purpose, regaining a sense of control and finding the thing that gives purpose to life apart from the addiction or the mental illness, whether that be a job, a personal mission, school, volunteer work, or personal creative endeavors. We've put some emphasis on recovery supports at SAMHSA because we are trying to embrace the centrality of recovery to our mission. And we're working hard to make sure that each person in recovery must, can choose the range of services and supports that we know are, that he or she knows are right for him or her. People in recovery who have lived through or with the disease of addiction or mental illness must be meaningfully involved in all aspects of behavioral health services, including planning, policy development, training, delivery, administration, and research. Which brings me to Roland Lamb, who embodies the principles of recovery in his life and his work. He's been an unrelenting recovery advocate throughout his distinguished 35 years career in the addiction field. Roland has helped recovery. And what we were doing in Philadelphia is whenever I have a chance to come before a gathering such as this, I now greet folks with the saying, the struggle continues. And I ask you to respond by saying, the victory is certain. So the struggle continues. The victory is certain. Amen. You've honored me beyond anything that I've done. And I gotta be honest with you by saying that uh, I would like to accept this award, but in, in, in the name of people, places, and things. You see, I've been blessed to be in the company of so many people embracing recovery in Philadelphia, especially over the last six years. I've had the privilege of working with people of extraordinary vision, talent, creativity, and determination, all born out of the knowledge that we can and do recover. Not from a drug, behavior, diagnosis, or billing code, but our humanity. Therefore, I must gracefully, you know, gratefully acknowledge all those struggling in long-term recovery, those that are struggling getting their recovery legs under them, those struggling just starting their recovery, and my personal friends, those struggling serially seeking recovery. Congratulations, Rose. Our next presenter of the Vernon Johnson Award is the Deputy Director of the Office of State, Local, and Tribal Areas for the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, Benjamin Tucker. Mr. Tucker was nominated by President Obama to serve as Deputy Director, overseeing several programs for ONDCP, including the Drug Free Communities Program, the National uh, Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign, and the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program. We're delighted he could present the next award, Mr. Tucker. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, um, I've been asked to be brief, and I will be brief and direct. I, I just want to say, though, I had a, a, a pleasure of meeting Mike Barry uh, this, this evening for the first time. And so, uh, I'm presenting him with the award this evening, and uh, I just have to say that uh, it's pretty clear why, why he's deserving uh, of the award. I had the, the opportunity to talk with him briefly, uh, as well as his lovely wife, Donna, um, and um, had the, the, of course, had the background information, uh, which I will read in a second. But um, you know, it's clear that that uh, we shared some personal stories about recovery. Um, I'm, I'm no stranger to it, both uh, in terms of the job that I do every day. I mean, uh, the Office of Drug Control Policy uh, has, for the first time in its National Drug Control Strategy, included uh, recovery as a, a, an integral part of of our policy moving forward. <laughs> personal note for me, you know, I have some cousins that, that I shared this story with Mike and Donna um, who, who were in serious trouble and, and I mean I was much younger then and I thought that they were, uh, I thought we were going to lose them and, um, and they ended up in treatment um, and have been in recovery now, probably approaching 35 years, um, remarried, have families, um, it's a beautiful thing. And so with that um, being true to my promise to be brief. Um, I just want to read the, 
uh, a little bit about uh, Mike's career. After a distinguished, uh, uh, distinguished 40 year career in broadcast news, Mike chose to dedicate his considered skills, energy, and passion uh, to advocacy for those in recovery uh, from addiction to alcohol and drugs, those seeking it, and their families. Mike's work uh, with Kentucky's recovery organization, which he founded, People Advocating Recovery, has broadened understanding of recovery as a public health issue. He led PAR's growth from a group of, this was pretty amazing, he was telling me the story about how he started with four or five people, and uh, before he knew it, they had 5,000 members of, of, of the organization statewide uh, throughout Kentucky. Uh, clearly, he's got what it takes to, to stimulate people and get people's attention and focus them on an issue uh, that matters. Uh, Mike has truly brought the voice of recovery to the fore in Kentucky uh, through the uh, PAR Advocacy Training Center, where he's developing advocates uh, and leaders to increase awareness of recovery and to reduce stigma and discrimination against those in recovery and those still struggling with addiction. Mike, you are truly a champion. Um, it's been my privilege to, to meet you this evening and to spend some brief time with you. Um, and uh, so, without further ado, I should present Mike with the, with the award.
privilege to be a fill-in for a fill-in here. So it's, and actually, the e, e folks, I have to say, have been very generous in their support, both for this event tonight, as Pat will attest, and for recovery in general going on. So we're very grateful to them for that. As Steve mentioned, my name is Dean Peterson. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I've been, which means I haven't had a drink or drug in 21 years. Um, I, I didn't know Jimmy Gillen until today. I had lunch with him. I sat by him at lunch. And not knowing I would do this till the end of the meal. <laughs> And I got to tell you, first of all, he's a very talented guy. The music that we heard when we walked in, that was him. He was a professional storyteller in Europe, traveling around as an itinerant storyteller, very interesting guy. But for me, we I work at Hazelden. I worked, actually, Meyer, I should say, I worked for a Republican congressman. I hope you don't hold that against me because I'm not one myself. I worked for one. But I'm at Hazelden, and our corporate mission there is to bring hope healing and health to all people. And Jimmy's just one of those people, and this was just from sitting by him, who has that rare uh, infectious peace and serenity, a gentle spirit, a winsomeness, attractiveness that just draws you to him. And I think embodies what we're trying to do here by a face and voice of recovery. So I'm really uh, privileged to, to give him this award and grateful to have met him and hope we can keep our relationship going. My name is Jim Gillen. I'm a person in long-term recovery. That means I haven't found a need for any reason to use alcohol or other drugs since 1998. And as a result, my life has gotten a whole lot better. As evidence, I'm very, very fortunate and very grateful individual. Grateful to Steve, Pat, the wonderful folks at Faces and Voice of Recovery, Administrator High, Dr. Clark, all you great people, and my uh, peep, Yvette Torres, the guru of National Recovery Month, who um, as being a person in recovery, one of the things that I get to do is I'm a National Recovery Month planning partner. I'm a licensed clinician in the state of Rhode Island. I'm a musician, I'm a storyteller, I'm a dad, I'm a grandpa, you know, I'm a husband. And uh, without recovery, I would be none of those things. Although I did tell some stories. <laughs> we won't, we're not going to go there tonight. Um, I'm the director of the Anchor Recovery Community Center, which is Rhode Island's first and only recovery center. Uh, since we opened our doors December 20, uh, December 2nd of 2010, we've had over 23,000 visitors. You think that's a meeting or what? I'm ever so grateful to the Providence Center, which is our host, our parent company. Uh, they're Rhode Island's largest community mental health center and addiction provider and um, you know without their support they go beyond support they've embraced recovery uh, they believe in it and they have really you know you talk about a marriage made in heaven and you know the universe set me up with the providence center i couldn't be more grateful um, i'd like to thank my boss my director who is also you know keeps me from believing the hype sharon morello my colleague gina rivera who loves the You know, recovery is possible. You know, recovery is a beautiful thing. Recovery. Um, we are very pleased to have Stephanie Gamas with us tonight. Steph represents the family of Joel Hernandez, who are helping us carry on his legacy. <coughs> Stephanie. Taylor for um, once again inviting me to come and speak on my family's behalf. So I appreciate that. 
and I'll promise not to cry. <laughs> okay. Early in the spring of 1941, a poor crop failed in Texas, Casadini, a great grandfather, to ask Grandpa Hernandez to help in relocating the family to California. It took Grandpa a few months to organize and ex execute a plan to alleviate this family crisis. The answer was to relocate both families to California. The two families added up to 19 members, 6 adults and 13 children, including the toddler, Joel. The trip on an army truck became a family legend as many humorous and trying incidents occurred during the 1,500 mile trip from Waco, Texas to Escondido, California. Grandpa was familiar with the rich agricultural opportunities waiting in California. Escondido, a small town north of San Diego, offered work in the citrus packing houses and in the orchards according to other transplanted family members. Plus the year-round temperature climate and intoxicating scent of orange blossoms provided another incentive. The mood in the truck was joyous. Mother spoke of establishing homes and the fathers discussed the flourishing uh, citrus industry. Most of all, the possibility of unending work drifted through every conversation. Surely the Golden State promised future family prosperity, and it did. Jobs were plentiful, and despite being back-breaking, the men valued this appointment as means of supporting their families. It was ingrained that if work existed, nothing prevented them from working. They approached their task with their personal best. Thus, 50 years later, when Raytheon refused to rehire Dad, a rehabilitated and a highly skilled calibration technician, he refused to accept defeat. He drew on the values by which he was raised, a job he once excelled and existed, and he held firm to his right to seek employment. Meanwhile, during the legal interims, he worked as a janitor at a strip mall. Again, imprinted family values prevailed. All work was honorable and should be performed with one's personal best. In time, he was promoted to a supervisory position, the mall owners awarding his unshakable work ethic. Dad invested 10 years legally pursuing his case and larger cause of rehabilitated former employees. It took a toll on him both physically and financially. In 2001, when Hernandez v. Raytheon reached the U.S. Supreme Court, it resolved the issue for many who had endured discrimination at the whim of former employers. For a year after the case was adjudicated, he recounted the details of the lengthy work, work rights battle to kindred groups and organizations. When he became too ill to travel, he followed cases from his home in Tucson. The Hernandez family did prosper in Escondido. Presently, there are over 600 descendants of my great-grandfather. And as anticipated, the citrus industry provided a stepping stone to a better life. Dad left California by joining the Air Force and happily made Arizona his home for over 40 years. However, he never forgot the enthusiasm the family exhibited during the trip west. Work waiting, trying times were over, and sunny skies prevailed. Tonight, the Mixion Foundation is the fourth recipient of the Joe Hernandez Award. Their focus on peer recovery and valuable links to recovery resources merit recognition. Founded in 2004, this Richmond-based facility reflects Dad's mission of support services for recovery. Our family thanks Faces and Voices for naming this award in my father's name by paying homage to his contributions to this ongoing effort. The seeds of fairness originated long ago in the orange and lemon orchards where the boy Joel tagged along with older relatives. He earned the right to work in a non-discriminatory environment through his legal trials and believed others merited the same. He was relentless in pursuing rights for rehabilitated <laughs> and believed in the transforming power of recovery. Whether it is fast California agri agricultural fields or the, or the sterile environment of sensitive
to electronic systems or any workplace, employers should willingly welcome the rehabilitated candidate as a qualified and productive employee. Now I'm honored uh, to present this year's Joel Hernandez Award to the McShin Foundation. Tony Spencer will be accepting the award on behalf. And Tony, would you please come up? this award, uh, so he sent me an email to make it clear to me why. Um, those of you who know John will appreciate this email. It starts out, Big T, you got four minutes of glory. Don't F it up. <laughs> remember, <laughs> remember, you exemplify McShin's purpose in relation to proliferating the support community stakeholders and the improvement of and delivery of peer recovery support services. Uh, he gave me a list of people to make sure I didn't leave anyone out to thank. So the first person is, of course, John Shinnell. So he didn't put himself on the list, but he is the president and co-founder of the McShin Foundation. He's the heart and soul of the McShin Foundation. He's one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet. His wife, uh, the co-founder, Carol McDade, she's the Mick in McShin. Mick McDade and the Shin, the Shin all the way, and that's the name of our Daniel Payne, the uh, executive director of Life of Kenzie, two of the best looking people you'll see, and, and their children, just, it's a gorgeous family, they should be the poster family for, uh, for recovery, just a great looking family, uh, both uh, Daniel and Kenzie, I believe, long term recovery, and uh, um, great, great folks. We have Hunter Jones, who's the IT coordinator. <laughs> Honestly, uh, Miller, the, the administrator, Frank Brewer, who's the uh, community relations coordinator, Peter Schinholzer, senior peer coordinator, Mike Mason, I don't think he's here, uh, peer in charge of development, Patty Valentine, um, uh, the director of the Addiction Recovery Council of Virginia, and a McShin volunteer. Uh, is Pastor Mike Poole here? Yes. Um, Reverend Poole is the one who made, uh, he's the, the pastor at Hatcher Memorial Baptist Church in the Richmond area, and he made space available for McShin's uh, Central Recovery Center. Uh, it's a wonderful place if you ever get a chance to visit. It's a place of just tremendous hope. Um, the board of directors of the McShin Foundation, uh, great thanks to them. It's made up 85% of people in that other board are in long-term recovery from addictions, and they're still uh, active members in their respective pathways to recovery. And then we have Dr. Jimmy Thompson. Dr. Jimmy, is the uh, incoming volunteer medical director. Uh, John said to be sure also to thank uh, Bill White, uh, who's not with McShane. He's the, uh, every, I think everybody in the room knows who he is, the, uh, the author and peer advisor of uh, the Addiction Technology Transfer Centers. Uh, Wes Clark, the director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. Uh, Pat Taylor um, and Pam Hyde, uh, the administrator of uh, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, what a great honor uh, for the McShin Foundation to get an award named after Joel Hernandez, who uh, I guess it's been a theme here tonight, but he really is the one that, uh, that um, literally said, uh, recovery, we have a, uh, a civil right to that, and took it to the Supreme Court, uh, the United States Supreme Court. That's been a theme tonight, that it's a civil right. And what, a, what, a, what a great job your, your, your father did, and, and what an honor it was for the McShin Foundation to, to get this award. Uh, in your father's name. Um, I told you when I started, I don't work with the McShin Foundation. I'm a prosecutor. Um, uh, yeah. um, you know, a lot of the people that uh, are in recovery have also been in jail. I'm the guy that locked you up. Uh, but I've been a prosecutor for a long time, and, uh, and it occurred to me that, that what we're doing is not increasing public safety at all. 
we have uh, the, the, the typical uh, scenario we have, we have someone that breaks into someone's shed and steals some power tools and we lock them up for a year or two and they get back out. And the reason they did it is they're addicted. And they get back out and they go back to using and they break into somewhere else and we lock them up for a year or two and they get back out. Or you have a person who, who drinks and ends up uh, getting violent and we lock them up for a little while and they get back out and they drink and they get violent again. We're not increasing public safety, you know. I was very frustrated with this. Uh, and uh, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, John Schinholzer, uh, I guess it was about 14 months ago. And he, he told me about the McShin Foundation. I hadn't heard of it before. What makes the McShin Foundation successful, I've been seeing a lot now of the McShin Foundation. I can tell you what I think makes it successful. And, and everybody up here has probably heard me say this seven or eight times now at the various functions. But uh, for those who haven't, uh, there are three things I think that really distinguish uh, what the McShin Foundation does. They make recovery fun. Um, and it sounds like uh, Mr. Gillen's doing that in Rhode Island, too. Um, you know, this isn't doom and gloom. This is, you know, you, recovery can be fun. Uh, they have, par I go to their parties now. I've been in the last 14 months, I've probably been to about 10 or 12 parties. Uh, they have parties in the country, they have pool parties, they have uh, concerts. They have banquets. Uh, it's fun. Uh, we have my wife and I both. And I, I have to thank my wife too, uh, Danielle. Uh, um, we have a great time. We take our daughter. She has a great time. Um, it, so they make recovery fun. The second thing I think they do is when you give up alcohol or drugs, you're giving up your circle that you hung out with. They give you a new circle to hang out with. Uh, and, and I think that's very important. And then the other thing that the McShin Foundation does is they, uh, if, you, if you've been in recovery for a week, they get you involved in helping the guy who just walked in the door. They get you invested immediately in someone else's recovery, which helps you in your own recovery. Um, and they're, they're very successful with it. Now, when I heard about this program, and I was very frustrated that we just kept a revolving door of the jail, um, I sat down with John, and he and I worked on an idea together, and here's what we do. I won't be long with this, but I think it's important for everyone to hear this, because there are a lot of important policy makers in here, and this is for you. Uh, and I think what we're doing in, I'm the Commonwealth's attorney in Caroline County, the elected prosecutor. It's a small rural county. We have less than 30,000 people. Uh, but uh, I think we're really, what we're doing, no one else in the country is doing. Um, what sets us apart from the drug court program is the people who are running our program are people in recovery themselves. The person who's directing our recovery center, where we are sending people from the court, is a convicted felon. I don't think you're going to find that in many places anywhere in the, in the country. What we did is this. We had, in Caroline, if you were put into probation, you have to go see a probation officer 30 miles one way. If you have to take uh, counseling courses, you have to go 20 miles another way. Um, you're supposed to also find a job. You're supposed to attend meetings. They put you on what are called color codes. I don't know if you all know about this, but you have to call in every day. And if your color comes up, you got to drop what you're doing and go to your probation officer and pee in a cup to make sure that you're not using. And people couldn't keep jobs with this. I mean, how can you keep a job when any day you might have to go uh, to a, a, a probation officer and you don't know? So people are losing their jobs. Um, they're supposed to be going to AA or NA meetings every day. This is in a county where we had one NA meeting a week. You're supposed to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. How are you going to do that? We had three AA meetings in the county a week. That was it. This is also a county with no public transportation. Most of the people, and if you get convicted of a drug crime in, in Virginia, you lose your license for six months. We were setting these people up for failure. There was no way it was going to work. So we had a simple plan. We were very fortunate to find a partner, uh, this Masonic Lodge, to cross the street from the courthouse that let us use their space. They only have one meeting a month. They said the rest of the time you can use it as a recovery center. And it's a simple plan. We're not going to send you to a probation officer. We're not going to send you to, uh, to classes here. We're not going to send, we're going to have a recovery center across the street from the courthouse. And the only requirement is you go there every day for the first 90 days. After that, you've got a recovery coach, and the recovery coach can tailor how often you need to come. We have meetings in the, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. So if you've got a day job, you can go at night. If you've got a night job, you can go in the day. But we've got meetings. We have 
we've gone from having one NA meeting a week, we have three meetings a day you can go to. Uh, now, that's the, if you do this, so what we're doing is we're sending people there. We're doing this pre-adjudication, not post-adjudication. They get arrested on a, on a Tuesday. They're in court on Friday. We're sending them to the program then, continuing their case for a year. And if they're successful uh, in recovery, we're dismissing their charges. So they don't go to jail. They don't get a conviction. And they've got 12 months of recovery under their belt. Our credits will continue for 12 months. What we want is 12 months sobriety. And we know that relapse is a part of recovery. The carrot in this program is that if you complete this, you don't get convicted and you don't go to jail. The stick is if you relapse, we're going to put you in jail for a week the first time. And then you come back out. One of the things they do at the recovery center is you're subject to random drug and alcohol screens. We're going to put you in jail for a week. Then you come back out. You go right back into recovery. Uh, and, and these aren't just people who have committed drug crimes. These are people who have committed larcenies and assaults and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, the second time you relapse, we're going to send you for a little bit longer. Maybe two weeks, maybe a little longer. The third time, we're going to send you a little bit longer. Fourth time. But we're not going to give up. There's no three strikes, you're out. You can, if you relapse, we're going to keep working with you. You get out of the program when you've got 12 months clean. It's, it's something I don't think anyone else in the country is doing. Um, and I'm very proud and, and happy to be a part of it. Um, again, I'm not with, I'm not part of the McShin Foundation, but I love the McShin Foundation, and I'm, I'm very honored to have been asked to accept this award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. First, let me um, echo Tony Spencer's remarks. I can remember when I was uh, elected Attorney General in Rhode Island, it was the Attorney General's office that was the impediment to going forward with the drug court. And we reversed that immediately, and the drug court has been extremely successful since then. We don't have some of the rural issues, so there's a lot of supports uh, available to us, and it's worked out extremely well, but I appreciate the uh, inventiveness and the compassion with which you've gone about your responsibilities. I'm very happy to be with you. I feel very much at home. Uh, Steve is from uh, Rhode Island. Uh, Ed Jurith and his family uh, come from Rhode Island. Your wonderful uh, award recipient tonight, Jim Gillen, is from Rhode Island. I believe he's here with uh, Doreen Stafford, his wife, who is from Rhode Island and runs as the executive assistant and manages and runs the Women's Resource Center in Newport. Uh, I just saw Sharon Morello, who runs the acute care services for the Providence Center in Rhode Island, and I'm told that Gina Rivera from the Anchor Recovery Community Center is also here. So you may not know it, but this is Rhode Island night here. <laughs> and I'm very glad of that. And um, uh, Tom Coderre would have really put, been the sort of cherry on top, but he's busy because our Senate is still in session and he is the Chief of Staff to our Senate President and is doing a phenomenal job. I've known him for many, many, many years and uh, he's just a wonderful guy and I'm glad he was able to do such good work for all of you. I just want to add one personal note. Uh, the other reason I feel very comfortable here is that um, my family has had a lot of exposure to this issue. My brother <laughs> is a recovering uh, drug and alcohol addict. He is seven years clean and sober and runs a recovery facility in California. really very uh, wonderful that he's been able to take that circumstance in his life and turn it to such advantage to help so many others. Uh, I have a very dear childhood uh, friend whose son uh, turned up a heroin addict and my brother was able to intervene and get that whole situation sorted out and the love and gratitude that the mom expressed to him I think was a tries beyond measure because it's hard when you are doing this and it's a very close community as you know but it doesn't always get back to your base community what an important transition you've made in your life and so for him to have this experience was really remarkable and then another family member uh, just went through a uh, rehab experience and it was overdue but it took 
certain amount of effort to get him to face up to it. And again, there was my brother at the point, making it happen, making it easy for everybody around, and uh, making it work. So it's something that I'm very proud of in his life, and I see the kind of transformation that people who have been through recovery and turn themselves to the recovery of others are able to experience. I don't know that I want to become a drug and alcohol addict in order to be able to have that experience, but I do know that people who have that experience have achieved a very rare gift for themselves as well as for others when they are able to take that on in their lives. So I, from my heart, really congratulate and salute all of you who have um, made that magic happen in your own life and in the lives of others. I'm delighted to be with you. I do sit on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and we have a lot of issues that relate to this, so please feel that you have an open door to me and to my staff on issues that are helpful to drug courts and to uh, rehabilitation as we go forward. So I won't keep you longer, but I'm proud to be with you, and thank you for including me in Rhode Island Night. Our next presentation is very special. Um, Dr. Wesley Clark, the director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and a leader of the nation's efforts to provide addiction treatment to the more than 22 million Americans who have a substance use disorder, is here to honor the passing of one of the recovery movement's finest advocates, Lisa Moya Torres. Dr. Clark, will you come up? Um, so I wanted to uh, uh, take that time to talk about Lisa Moya Torres, uh, as you know. Um, I, first I was going to ask for a moment of silence, but then I decided that rather than do that, I'd, talk, uh, I'd repeat some of her words. It turns out in 2007, Bill White, who we've heard about uh, uh, several times this evening, uh, interviewed her. And so I thought what I'd do is read some of her words words to you. One uh, section of her comments dealt with on addiction as a brain disease. She said, it wasn't until I came to understand that there were actual sections of my brain that are structurally and functionally different from a quote, normal, healthy, end quote, brain, that I was able to appreciate how determination could never be a match for something that isn't working. It'd be like trying really hard and then expecting to walk on a broken leg. I stopped hating myself for what I believed were defects of character and began to take comfort in the logic that a medication could be helpful in the management of my disease. And I came to understand that an effective dose of methadone could silence the horrific monster cravings for heroin and the obsessive thinking about getting and being high. That same dose neutralized the overwhelming emptiness and void I used to dread without heroin. I can't begin to express how absolute the life-altering this realization has been for me. This is why I'm so passionate about educating others, including and especially those suffering from addiction. Elisa was an advocate for medication-assisted treatments. So let me repeat some of her words. She says, my hope and that of my colleagues is that with the introduction of new safe medications which are incredibly effective in eliminating cravings for alcohol, medications will begin to become more and more widely used and accepted. With their increased use, acceptance of medication as a legitimate component of treatment, recovery, and prevention of addiction to substances will evolve to become a norm. I am hopeful that in the combination of public understanding an acceptance of addiction to substances as a disease, the anti-medication era and the treatment of addictions will begin to fade out, along with the myths, misinformation, and ignorance. She went on to say, I continually scream at the top of my lungs. Medications are not a magic bullet for addiction. Medications offer different benefits to different people at different times of their life and at different stages of their diseases in order to manage different components or symptoms. Addiction is a chronic disease for which at this point in time, there is no cure. Thank you, Dr. Clark. And I'd like to let you know that the Board of Directors of Faces and Voices of Recovery will be establishing 
uh, Lisa Moya Torres Award, which will be given out for the first time next year. Uh, that concludes our festivities for the evening. Uh, we certainly would like to thank Faces and Voices, thanks our generous friends and supporters who have made tonight's event possible. Again, congratulations to all of the winners. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope to see you next year, and also in between, acting on behalf of recovery. Thank you.